Hello church, here we are in a brand new book of the Bible. Don't get too comfortable because we're not going to stay here very many days. But I want to show you a couple of beautiful things about the book of 1 Kings. I want to let you know that 1 Kings is a book that is historically accurate and astoundingly so, but it is not just a history book. You'll notice at later, after we go through Proverbs and stuff, and we come back into the book of 1 Kings, you'll recognize that over and over it'll stay in there about certain kings. If you want to read about the history of how they accomplished, took over certain cities and accomplished uh, some battles and different things like that, you could read that in different books. This book has a different purpose, and it itself says that over and over. And the purpose that this book highlights very frequently is that there's one God, and we ought to serve him wholeheartedly. We will get to that. Uh, once we come back to the book of 1 Kings. But I also want you to see something in chapter 1 that's kind of connected to that. That this is not just a history book. This is about God applying this book to your and my life today. And it's very relevant. In chapter 1, you'll notice that in this story of Adonijah, who is now trying to steal the throne from his father David, and it's a wretched story or kind of a disheartening story, um, three times in chapter 1, it's noted that Adonijah tries to set up a meeting in which he doesn't in invite certain people. In verse 10, verse 19, and in verse 26, it, it mentions three times in a row that he didn't invite Solomon and certain other people because he's trying to accomplish something else. And we might even apply that in a combination to what I just said about the book of 1 Kings and ask the Lord a question about that because we should be careful that we don't try to look at 1 Kings just from a historical perspective and then forget to invite the Holy Spirit to show us things as we read this book, as we read any chapter in the Bible. And so let's not make that same mistake that Adonijah made. In, in, for us, it's about inviting the Holy Spirit. I think of things, uh, verses like 2 Timothy chapter 2 that would say, reflect on what I am saying and the Lord will give you insight into all this. It's the Lord that we need to invite to give us insight into his book. Psalm 119 says the same, similar thing. Open my eyes that I would see wonderful things in your law. It's a supernatural, spiritual thing that the Lord needs to do, and we ought to invite him to do that. And so one thing you could do right now, you could ask the Lord a question like this. You could even pray to the Holy Spirit of Jesus and say, Holy Spirit, would you open my eyes? I am officially inviting you to show me wonderful things in your law. And then wait in expectation and keep on reading. It's going to be awesome. And then I want to park on something here about parenting. There are some wonderful parenting warnings and uh, examples in this, in this chapter. You'll notice in, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6, that it says his father David never interfered with Adonijah. The NLT words it very bluntly and says David never disciplined Adonijah. And that kind of launches into this complicated story about how Bathsheba and Solomon, their lives are being threatened and Nathan has to step in and this big complicated story and then Adonijah is holding on to the horns of the altar and it's all a, quite a bit of drama that really would never have had to take place if there had been proper discipline practiced in the home of David, at least to his son Adonijah. That's what verse six leads us to. And so we're, we ought to be thinking a little bit about parenting, whether you had, have been a parent, are a parent, or whether you plan to be a parent one day or whether you know somebody who's a parent. You can learn from this. And there's a beautiful example of good parenting in, in chapter 2. If you look at verse 36 and 37, and then maybe 39 to 40, and then verse 46, you see what Solomon does to Shimei is a great example of what I would might describe as natural consequence parenting. Solomon has a conversation with Shimei, points out, here's the boundary lines, and here is what you are, what is going to happen if you disobey. They both agree to it, and they agree. There's no emotion in that. It just is what it is. And then there's disobedience that follows. And when the disobedience happened, Solomon doesn't have to make a decision. He just has to execute what is previously being arranged. It's a natural consequence. And so this is what we see happen here. Of course, we, when we're parenting, we shouldn't be using the death penalty, just to a bit of a caveat there. But the concept remains... It's called natural consequence parenting, and it will make it, you will have different kids if that's how you parent. And so, one question you might ask the Lord is Am I parenting in a biblical way? Spend some time with Jesus on that. And then, a beautiful verse, uh, two verses here in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. 
David is about to pass away. He's an old man and he's giving this charge to Solomon and he tells Solomon to be a man. Be a man and follow, pursue the Lord, find out his decrees and his laws and his requirements and, and, and observe his ways and do that. Follow that with zeal for your whole life. Church, sometimes we are, the world would have a similar sentiment when it says be a man, but it's referring to something a little different. Often when we hear the words be a man, we think about somebody who is very strong physically, never shows emotion, is tough. And yet there are times like that when, when David is telling Solomon, be strong as well. But he's saying it in a biblical context. And you know who the best example of strength is? The Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody was stronger than Jesus. And yet he showed true and proper and appropriate emotion. He was gentle, he was compassionate, and yet exercised like incredible authority that we can never even attain to. What a strong man. And he loved people in a self-sacrificing way. And so here's what you could do today, church. If you are a man, you could pray and say, Lord Jesus, help me to be a man as described in the Bible. And if you are a woman today, what you could pray, Lord Jesus, how can I encourage the men in my life to be the biblical definition of a man? And then celebrate that with Jesus today.